Yes, let's get started. On the webinar today, I'm joined by Jen. Uh, I'm hoping Jen can say a quick hello, Jennifer. Yep, hey there. Nice to meet everyone. Um, really nice to see so many of you on. Uh, my name is Jen. I'm a product manager at Phaser. Um, I'm mostly going to be quiet until a little bit later on and let Alan do all the talking and set a, a wonderful stage. <laughs> I'll, I'll try, Jen. Uh, I, no best, uh, I best suggest what gives me the right to be in front of you all today. Uh, perhaps give you some confidence and a little comfort that I have the credibility to talk to you on this subject. And let's be clear, I'm no expert. We are always learning from one another through these sort of events, the experiences we gain over time. And wow, uh, it's been 25 years for me in business process outsourcing. I've shared time working with, perhaps best to say partnering, many of the top one to three organizations, tier one to three organizations, to obtain, source, and deliver opportunities that improve employee experiences and organizational effectiveness. I've been in the HRIS world or HCM space internationally for over 17 years. So time really does fly. So I guess let's press on. Uh, the agenda. No webinar or presentation will be complete without some signpost of our discussion over the coming 30 to 45 minutes together. And this is no exception. We'd like you to ensure you stay until the very end where possible. So here are some of those directions we're likely to take as we explore this topic, how to manage payroll and HR events by exception within a complex single country, multi-country processing environment. Gosh, that is a pretty grand title and fairly ambitious topic to cover in, well, what is less than 45 minutes or actually less than 30 minutes with a brief proof of life demo. Yes, we're gonna go there. This is not just smoke and mirrors this session. We shall attempt to see what we can achieve now. Uh, but before, and regardless, we hope that this discussion will excite, perhaps provoke even enough thought to suggest options you didn't previously believe were possible. Even consider carving out time in the near future that uh, we can share with you specifically to discuss you and your business. But the agenda, as promised, where are we today and how do we get here? Do we have options and what are they? We all strive, I think, to work smarter, but how can this be accomplished whilst maintaining controls and more importantly, remaining agile? Something I think all of us in Power and HR strive to achieve. We will prove it uh, in this uh, element. Uh, we'll would have done a fair amount of talking by that point, or I would have done a fair amount of talking by that point. So I'd like to be able to show what we can deliver tangibly and emphasize what is possible. And then I'll be over to you for questions and comment, comments. So, hope that's okay. Let's press on further. Every journey starts with understanding. Where are we today and how do we get here? Global Pair on HR. Now, there's a subject we can get our teeth stuck into. Whether we're just starting out as a single country subject matter expert, or we have grown into a multi-country analyst, advisory expert, or even a global le leader, we can all understand the complexities during our daily work life as we strive for greater controls and perfection in our world. Yes, I said it, strive and perfection. And yes, we do in the hours that we put in achieve this. We all do because the business and all employees expect us to get this process right every time. So there is absolutely no pressure at all on any of us, right? Uh, let's get into the weeds and look at this in some detail. I mean, when we consider that the average business operating in multiple environments with multiple pay groups, geographies, locations, or even both, all can have over 30 tools and more than double that in data sources, likely even more so. We are dealing with multiple flat platforms, not just those common corporate tools, if we're lucky enough to have them. Yes, I said, if we're lucky enough to have have them, although that may be subjective, like a finance or a HR system, a record, but also there are collective local or regional tools, local providers like payroll, HR, benefits, equity, expenses, bonuses, and of course, that all important Excel uh, or in all its flavors. We have multiple stakeholder partners, all with differing timelines, presenting different jurisdictional complexities, cutoffs, not forgetting language barriers, 
to add to a growing list of labels and element descriptions by geography. But also there's those personal requests and last minute adjustments. We have to consolidate a mass of information, translate this into common, if lucky, tables to start the process, all from a common framework, no small task, uh, of course, to say the least. However, invariably, we have grown into this position Given the required urgency placed upon us by our respective business partners, we want to be agile in the face of business change, growth, acquisition, mergers, or simply adapting to global events. We always have new pressures pushed our way. Achieving agility in HR and payroll is another topic in itself combined. But this leads us to the world of manual processes, workarounds, and often pretty fragmented processes as a result of our desire to be perfect and support everyone on demand. Furthermore, when we add these variables together, even with our best intentions, central governance and controls often differ across our organizational entities. Then of course, we are required to produce consolidated reports upon all variables and be able to drill down to the employee level at the drop of a hat. No small task again in itself, as we all know and understand. Multiple systems, vendors, stakeholders. This adds a layer of complexity to everything, especially around information security and data protection. We have constantly moving goalposts concerning compliance. And my absolute favorite topic, uh, since the majority of global play payroll players and HR vendors purport to offering this as standard, albeit the reality is very different, something I've discussed many times in my past, that's being the gap of vendor deliverables and client expectations plus how to bridge it. It's the challenges of connecting payroll, HR and financial systems together, all without writing blank checks or completely re-engineering processes, sources and data outputs. All in all, we have a myriad of moving parts, people, systems, tools, and rules to combine in each and every period that we work, often with little thanks for getting it right and significant headaches for errors. This is precisely why we spend so much time checking each and every element in the weeds, crunching the numbers, listening to some peaceful tunes uh, or locked in solitary confinement during the latter stages of the payroll cycle. This is how we've got to where we are today. Let's take a moment to read this slide. Well, actually, no, let's not. So I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, the post-pandemic world, payroll is more challenging than ever, especially managing multi-payroll instances, stakeholder expectations, and mixed infrastructure landscapes. Businesses don't need to be convinced upon the need for the right tools to keep pace, become more agile, and deliver stakeholder on-demand services that are plug and play. Bold ambition. The challenge is then concerning all of these tools that we buy as a, as, a, as a business entity, how do we put these tools and services together coherently or coherently? Am I blaming vendors here? No, categorically not. They are merely attempting in their way to see challenges and fix them. But I hope you won't shut down this window and put down a coffee uh, cup in protest. Please simply lean in further uh, type your questions and comments uh, for the moderators in the Q&A tab and relax a bit more into your chairs for the remainder of the session because actually I'm on your side. I'm attempting to convey that the pace of change has increased and the number of events that impact this change has also grown more widespread, more frequent even. In my 17 years in this specific industry, I've seen ever increasing pressures and not much to aid our ability as practitioners to deal with it these. Well, not radically, and certainly not from a vendor agnostic point of view, and certainly not from a holistic perspective either. Not unless you have a very big checkbook at the ready. And what I hear today often is a little too much smoke and mirrors, and not enough tangible support for our daily operations, not enough to deliver any real value at pace, and aid a business case that does actually save money, especially when considering the outsource models of old, which many of us are all too familiar with. Yes, the one constant in life, HR and payroll, or certainly within HR and payroll, is change. Has technology helped or hindered this process of change? 
one could argue that we have been relatively slow to adopt any changes necessary, often for good reason. Back to those tangible benefits, proof points that we can make the change with ease. There is not a lot that is easy when we consider changing out payroll, HR platforms or partner, partners. And of course, when we consider the global context, we need to multiply this level of investment, disruption and project uh, cost into, an, into the number of countries we present, present. Finally, on this point, we are risk adverse. Of course we are. And with good reason, the lifeblood of our organization, the source of our competitive advantage even, is our people. We are primarily responsible for ensuring these people are paid correctly, although many of the elements necessary for calculating an individual's pay, you know, uh, go the accuracy of any payment relies on data sources that are often, nearly always, beyond our direct control and within the wider business. Herein lies the key problems, if not the key challenge we have to manage daily. Data, its volume, its uniqueness, its formatting, its existing sources, and of course, its ownership. So within the context of data, this is where we get to the meat and bones, I guess, of the session, the art of the possible. And again, let's be very clear here. I'm not gonna start gazing deeply into a crystal ball. I'm sure I have one nearby uh, and talk about future possibi possibilities because well, that level of speculation, in my opinion, does not help us in the here and now, nor does it benefit anyone talking wax lyrical about what if scenarios and how vendors are going to help in some distant future. No, sorry. Although my crystal ball has been fairly accurate uh, on these type of topics, uh, not on lottery numbers, sadly, you will not get derived benefits that impact your business in the near term if I go this route today. So I'd prefer to focus on what options exist that are available to us now. And without breaking the business, breaking the bank, or waiting until some point in 2026 to achieve a benefit, probably long since forgotten when you or more likely a predecessor is no longer with you, but signed up for that project has long gone. Let's think about the options that we have available to us. If data is the key to unlocking so many advantages, then all we simply need to do is turn that key and start our engines. Yes, I hear what you're thinking already. Uh, and I see a couple of comments. Um, we don't have all the keys and nothing is simple. True, <laughs> there are so many keys within our organization, which is why we're basically stuck until everyone or the majority decides to, to use the same keys, no? Well, that is one option. You could re-engineer the entire organization or at the least, the components critical to driving payroll and HR data along the employee lifecycle into the processing engines. Then and only then, end-to-end -end control would be consistent, measured, timely, with data ownership and validation, of course, along the sequence. Thus, the exchange of information throughout the chain to this processing engine by country, by partner, who may be used, would be seamless and beyond exceptional repost or reproach. So, one could safely assume that as long as the payroll engines process the company specifics and country rules accurately, all should be correct, uh, if only. Look, um, however, I think uh, I use the word safely and assume there, and all should be correct. Well, if the data was accurately passed through and accurately processed by the engines by country, these are the points of failure, or well, this is where many failures can be attributed. Failures that can be generally solved by trained payroll professionals, right? Yes and no, I guess. Because yes, as practitioners, we have the capability to spot those anomalies, uh, correct them, but we're only human. We're not machines. Uh, although not to mention that machines are programmed by humans. Um, although these machines can also be programmed to learn. Uh, right, anyway, don't be concerned. I'm not going to veer off on a tangent and start talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, or even blockchain, perhaps. Um, although many of these te technologies are proven and have a place in many ecosystems. Hang on a second, wait, <laughs> let's not switch off just yet. 
There are far simpler approaches, approaches that can deliver transformation without re-engineering or reinventing yourselves, or even embarking on change for change's sake. We can change without change. I'll repeat that. We can change without change. No, I haven't gone mad, not just yet. Uh, let me come back to this, I think, in a moment. If we consider what is within our area of control, let's not forget, busted, phone should have been on silent. Let's not forget, we can only influence and change what is in our control. We can look to business process re-engineering as discussed. Um, this requires us to re-engineer our entire processes, operations, often tools. Furthermore, uh, you need to consider all elements if you are truly to reach the desired outcome. And this is a continual, or that would be a continual process of change, as it should be with an organization that experiences change on a regular basis. The BPO managed services option, well, we can do what so many have done before us, and so many continue to do, despite what they know will happen, outsourcing the system, process, the whole department. This business process outsource or a managed service as a software managed service, deriving software as a service element. I mean, in this option, we make another party responsible for the event or activity. However, does this, or does a BPO or managed service even actually solve the problem? Not forgetting that data is the key. It is the single biggest reason that in-house processes fall over or fail. That being poor data workflow and management. Outsourcing the problem merely passes that, passes that problem to another to solve. And they may succeed, although unlikely as they don't have control of the data end to end. But this would be a significant cost in terms of both time to value and employee satisfaction. So BPO managed services, well, they have a place. It's what we know. Um, better or worse of, e of two evils, perhaps. Deploying a pass approach. Well, when one considers an open standards platform approach, the existing processes, systems, tools, partners, and even infrastructure deployed can remain the same if you choose. But we're applying a layer of controls that provide options to smooth those areas that need the most attention. Uh, and let's put this into some context some more. This could be operational controls across the globe for all partners involved in the payroll process. This could be a reporting and analytics. This could be reporting and analytics, I could say or should say, plugged into your existing processes, infrastructure to consolidate data relevant to payroll, HR and finance. I mean, these are opportunities to report on all employees regardless of processing options, partners or vendors use today. You're deploying this over your existing infrastructure. It can be as simple as providing integration options and workflow automation into your existing HRIS and or corporate financial system. Yes, options delivered simply for automating data flow to and from your existing HR financial system with translation tables and validation built in as standard. That is the connectivity as standard, or that is providing connectivity as standard, I should say with options to suit not just corporate central tools like your work day, your Oracle Fusion, success factors, et cetera, but for local tools that derive your benefits or expenses, uh, time, leave, bonuses, equity, all those elements that we have to gather in addition to uh, the central tools. All automated as standard. Same for your corporate general ledger, regardless of financial system. You may want all payslips, let's say, transferred from your existing payroll vendor systems, partners into a single system of record without an army of consultants on manual manipulation. Yes, no problem with this type of model delivered using employee portals. The PASS approach, I think, answers so many questions quickly, simply, effectively with the pains or certainly without the pains of the options one or two. I think only this approach provides organizations with the time to value and agility to change out the underlying technologies at a pace that suits them. That is, if change is even needed, with 
that very technology and partner layer that exists today that you're used to. I said it before, change without change. Well, this is what I meant. This type of transformation is straightforward to implement and returns the all important time to value, not to mention tangible benefits quickly. It has just not been applied, I think, to our world until very recently. And that's what we're here to explore. So, okay, we've, we've, we've gone through most of this now uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to brace yourselves because what follows is one of those slides that tries to summarize all of that that I've just attempted to convey in a single dramatic il illustration. No, I'm not gonna blame marketing. Uh, I, I can only blame myself and, uh, for, for this one, but um, yes, it's complex. Uh, but if you consider that within the marketplace, or well, that's which is available within the marketplace today, there, there are three clear choices. An organization has to manage its landscape from a HR, finance and payroll perspective. Then it begins to make sense. And one hopes, if not now, but when you review this again, because we will be sharing, of course, uh, a recording of this uh, webinar and uh, the slides, if you so wish, perhaps we can revisit on one-to-one. -one. It will reboot your own journey towards working even smarter, achieving greater controls, and in my humble opinion, deliver more agility than you ever thought possible, creating perhaps even your own future of work framework. So I should have a drum roll here. Sound effect for marketing would be good next time. Uh, broadly speaking, we have, uh, the BPO approach, sorry, I'm pausing, I'm seeing more, more questions. Uh, I'm gonna come back to these uh, shortly. Uh, broadly speaking, we have the BPO approach on the left, uh, which is, or which are those hybrid aggregators, mixed in-house, third-party networks. These are those traditional vendors whose models have largely remained unchanged for the last 20 years. Um, on the right, we have uh, the in-house driven, managed re-engineering, programs that uh, will be as robust and complex as you choose within the boundaries of your resources you have internally in-house or that you perhaps secure through specialist vendors, solution providers and, uh, and consultancies. Finally in the middle uh, you can see uh, we have the PASS modular software approach uh, that can impact as much or as little as you require. The key here again to underline is that those deployed modules from a pass approach will overlay your existing infrastructure, software, approaches, systems, and partners. However, you can choose to improve the shortcomings in either your BPO uh, or business process re-engineering options by consolidating disjointed services that exist in those models and approaches today. Or you can simply engage solely to make the step change into greater services breadth, capability, and agility from a pass environment. Thus allowing you to change out existing infrastructure and partner components without ever, ever impacting either the users and stakeholders in the future. You have now, I guess, shifted focus from systems and tools to user experience and solve data workflow and automation challenges in one smooth step. So, what you need to take away from this is perhaps twofold. Firstly, we all have common understanding of the choices available. You know, it's an educated audience here. Uh, you, you, you know what each of these choices mean. Be these where you are today or where you aspire to be, these choices. In all instances, you will assess some, if not all of the topics necessary in terms of those bullets. Uh, down the left hand side from implementation duration to project cost versus the level of controls, flexibility, how agile the option is, uh, usability, appropriateness to your business sex, that's now and into the future. Secondly, although the platform and the service approach is illustrated in a separate path, it can and does to repeat positively impact all elements of the HR payroll financial, financial ecosystem. So should you deploy the approaches across your organization, equally important is the capability to deploy the modules that you are either lacking or that simply don't work in the BPO or business process re-engineering options. Yes, you can deploy selectively 
across your entire organization, regionally or locally by country if you choose, regardless of your existing landscape. So now we've got lots more options than we ever had before. I've talked a lot, an awful lot. So we thought about where we are today. I've touched upon how we got there. Uh, we've also talked about options that exist and even how we can consider working smarter, not harder to maintain and more likely improve the operational controls and further your opportunities to become more agile. Uh, now, I think it's probably important to prove some of these key points that we've touched upon. And let's address the elephant in the room again, data, and consider where to start with our potential to positively impact that which is necessary, the in-country specifics for processing payroll internationally. Furthermore, let's look at data through the lens of how do we manage that data from source to destination necessary for processing an individual's country's payroll? Let's then consider how we manage variances, which will provide us the greatest possible opportunity to focus on exceptions rather than the minutiae of the weeds within any given pay group and cycle. And then finally, we'll bring it full circle and look at how we can have clean and consistent data format in a single repository for all employees, regardless of how they're paid and where, and how easy it can be to draw off the necessary reports needed on a regular basis and assess our compliance by country to the statutory reg reg regulations. Now, I was gonna just hand over quickly to Jen uh, for her voice of experience in these areas. Let's just have a quick look and double check some of these notes here and the questions. Okay, good, thank you for, for those comments. Do keep them coming and on the Q&A tab. Uh, Jen, I can see you're there, so I'm gonna stop sharing, hand over to you. Uh, here we go now. Great, thanks for that, Alan. So while I get my screen uh, set up to share here, um, I'll just share a little bit about myself. So as I mentioned at the start, I'm a product manager here at Pazar. What I didn't mention is that I am a huge nerd. Um, I love data, okay? I've actually worked with a couple of data products in my career with analytics products and reporting products and things like that as, as well. So I really like data, but I also understand the importance of that data being good and usable. Um, a really common phrase in the analytics industry is garbage in, garbage out. You can't run magic on data that's not good. So what I wanted to take a little bit of time to show you today is some of the tools that we have to manipulate data and make that data management a little bit easier. And I hope um, that little intro will explain why these tools actually really excite me. So what I've got here is a couple of pay groups set up so that I can show you some of these tools here. Um, what I want to first show you is our HR Connect module. Uh, so what I'm going to do is jump into this data grid here. So this is a HRIS import data grid. What is this? Okay, HR Connect is uh, part of our system that allows you to import, manipulate, and check your HR data so that it's ready for processing by your payroll partner. So what I want to show you here briefly is the Excel file we're going to be working with. It's a fairly standard sample HR data export. Um, and what I want you to see, I suppose, really is just, we've got a, a large volume of data here. It's somewhat easy to spot some exceptions here, maybe a missing social security number or a missing cost center, but you can easily imagine that if this file was hundreds of rows longer, this would be quite a challenge. And that's a challenge that we all face all the time when we're trying to process payroll and make sure that our HR data is up to date. Before I import this file, I do just want to note also that there's 84 records in this file. Um, let me tell you why that's relevant here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and drop that file onto the data grid and upload it. So that's going to load into the data grid. And when it loads into the data grid, what you'll see is our rows imported here is only 58. Why is that? Well, we've actually done a little bit of clever filtering right at the import of the data. If I just pull back up my Excel, you'll see here that I have a pay group designation and not every pay group is the same. These, pay, these 
pay groups are for different countries. And I've actually done a bit of a filter straight away to only pull in the data from the pay group that we want to work with. So even though there's data in the file from more than one area, we can immediately start to hone in on the data that we care about. This is really helpful because obviously then we don't have to do that data manipulation work beforehand to separate out the data, to generate those multiple files for the different groups, I'm able to filter right away and focus on what's important. So we have our 58 rows, but obviously we might want to look at what has gone wrong in, um, what has gone wrong in the data or what might have changed in the data. Because we're trying to focus in on, I suppose, our, our things that we really need to check and care about, we allow you to filter here by errors or by changes. So I mentioned when we were looking at the Excel file that I had spotted, oh, a missing cost code and a missing social security number. Again, in our hundreds and hundreds of rows of data, that might be hard to find, but because we're using change and error detection on this grid, we can immediately focus in on those errors and see that some things need to be corrected before we can send this file. We're not gonna be able to send a file without a cost code or without a social security number. Equally, while we were able to spot the one or two missing records, it's a little bit harder to track our changes from period to period. Changes of first or last name, maybe change of a department, perhaps a change of next of kin or an IBAN. A changed IBAN could be incredibly important when we're processing payroll, changes to name, et cetera. And so it's really helpful to just be able to, again, pull the focus into what we really need to, what we really need to look at. We're just always cutting down our time spent validating by highlighting those particular areas that we need to look at. So I wanna take you across to a second data grid here, which is the variable items file. So I've already dropped in one file here. Um, this is a data grid for a number of variable payments, things that are going to change all the time. What I want to show here, I suppose, is that we have an expectation here that we'll have multiple pieces of data, but right now we've just got the one file in here, the equity payment file. So I'm going to go ahead and drop in another file on top of this and start to upload that data. When we give that a minute, we'll notice that we've imported some more rows. And you can see we've immediately added another bulk of data there. We've gone from five rows to 21 rows. But if we skip through our data here and look to some of our employees, we can see that it's aggregated the data for these employees. So if we hone in on, for example, Faith Wilkins, this is employee number 2150 here. You can see that she had an equity payment before we dropped that new file on, and now she has data in this bonus and bonus type. That's really convenient because what we've done here is we've aggregated this data into one row. So what we set up here is the ability to drop those multiple files, as Alan mentioned, all of those disparate sources that you've got into one clean data row so that when we finish aggregating all of our files, we can send one file that has all of these variable payments for each of these employees aggregated into a really nice, clean data set. Because you could also enable change detection and the error detection on this grid, it makes it really easy to see if something has been missed. So we could immediately see, oh, Carl's equity payment here is not there. We better go check that from our source file here. And of course, if you are like me and you like Excel, uh, and maybe you're still going to want to look at this data and perform some of those transformations or calculations by yourself. We've got lots of options here too. So there's plenty of options to export our nice, clean, aggregated data uh, to include our comments, to include attachments, to export our headers, even to export all of your data grids as separate files. So you can be performing multiple data aggregations and stick them all together and then export a nice, clean data set for review. So I think that's really neat. And now that we looked at the HR side of things, um, let's take a look at the payroll side of things. So I'm just gonna jump across to another tab here. This is a pay group that's at the payroll, payroll approval stage. So at this stage, a gross to net file has been uploaded 
and it's waiting for the, the payment approval. So if we look at the if we look at the um, the highlights here, we can see fairly immediately that there's a variance. Okay, there's a variance of eleven thousand one hundred and thirty here between our current period and this last period. So maybe that maybe we expected that. That's fine. Um, maybe there were some changes that we knew that was coming. But with the variance tab, we have the option to drill down into our figures and understand and explain the variance. Maybe someone has a question, the finance director or an employee, they're trying to understand what has happened in a given month. And we can drill right down to the employee level and see at that level what the changes were. So there were some changes in car allowance here, for example, and some changes in variable pay that ultimately go to our gross pay variance here at the top. We could also take a look, for example, at deductions and see there was a change in social security. Social insurance has changed and we have a variance here for these employees. Again, it's just that ease of focusing on what has changed rather than what is still consistent and good in our data set from month to month. It gives us that ability to drill down into our figures, understand and explain that variance. So I think this is really powerful for that pay group and pay period level. We can view month by month or pay period by pay period. But I do want to just touch on our global reporting as well, because we don't just look at our variance or our data changes or look for those exceptions at that individual pay group or pay period level. We also want to look to that global visibility. So when we look at our data aggregated here, obviously we have all of our options to turn on and off countries and to change the month. But just at a very high level, it immediately gives us that visibility. So we can again be looking for what's right and what looks like it might need checking. We see here, for example, we had a gross pay increase and then a decrease. Does that trigger a check? Do we have a change in headcount that maybe explains that increase or that decrease? Again, just this overview so that we can always try to be focusing in on what actually needs the checking and saving us time. The last thing I want to show then is the compliance dashboard. So obviously there are a lot of statutory filings that have to happen each period, each month. And the compliance tool here gives us a month to month overview of the compliance with the statutory filings. So again, it's just giving us that visibility and a way to ensure that filings are being completed on time. And again, maybe focus in on any pay groups that might be having issues that might need a little bit of attention. So I hope what I've shown here shows you that there are a lot of tools available there that can really help when it comes to crunching those numbers, that can kind of help us see through those weeds. And as Alan was talking about earlier, work smarter, not harder. Um, it's really challenging when you are dealing with data sets from multiple different sources, trying to aggregate those into something useful, and also trying to see those outliers and understand where we need to change, where we need to focus. If we think through the processes that we use um, and understand how they might change if we were to incorporate platform as a service, I think it's pretty clear that you can have a positive impact on all of the elements of HR, payroll and finance ecosystems and be better able to answer complicated questions about how payroll has changed from period to period and why it's changed. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Alan and answer any questions you have about this or our topic in general. Well, thanks, Jen. As I, I just lost my voice already as I was about to speak. Um, right, let's uh, just open this and share again. Okay, so look, we've talked a lot, both of us have now. Um, I think it's now your time to, uh, or turn at the very least, to, to chime in and for our moder moderators to share the key themes, comments, questions that have uh, come our way. And for me to try and uh, uh, find our way through these. So just bear with me a moment. I, I can see um, <clears throat> a few questions here now. One. I think this one uh, is largely for you, Jen. So sorry, I'm going to start putting you on the spot here. Um, yeah, look, you showed you showed effectively some Excel's uh, being dragged and dropped. It looked like. Um, yeah. 
Now, is this more back to smoke and mirrors? I mean, are they pre-formatted in some way? Or, or is it as simple as dragging and dropping data from one source to another? So it's, it's pretty simple. There's a little bit of setup. I showed you dragging and dropping onto those data grids. And obviously we've done a little bit of configuration so that the system knows what those grids are supposed to look like. It understands that when I drop this file, I should expect that there's first names and last names in the file, et cetera. We've done a bit of mapping to set that up, but that mapping is a one-time operation. We can also do things like, as I mentioned, filtering out data based on that, and also just indicating data rows to ignore as well. So we've done a little bit of configuration to make sure that the data that you're gonna work with in this data grid is actually relevant to what you wanna do, because mm -hmm. there might be files, uh, there might be um, rows and columns in that data set that you're not interested in looking at. But once that setup is done, it really is as simple as dragging and dropping the file across to have it be processed. And you may have seen on the pop-up when I dragged the file, it did also highlight for me that there were some new columns in the file that it didn't immediately recognize. If you on purpose wanted to add those columns, it would be as simple as clicking through at that time and saying, yep, no, that's a new column I've popped in there. It's the name of the bank, for example. Um, and I do want you to map that and every subsequent time now, please make sure that that column is in the data grid. So okay, it's pretty that, user friendly in terms of mapping, I think. And that's mapped within this system, not, not within Excel in some way. Or that the, is mapped within this system, system, I should say. Yeah, that is mapped within the system. So you know what your Excel exports look like. So you're able to just give our system a quick indication um, using a really simple UI to say what you expect the Excel to look like. This first name column, for example, that I showed, what is that in the Excel file? Once that's done, then yep, it's just a drag and drop it across and all of that mapping is, is done within this tool as well. So it's, so it's pretty straightforward. This, this has prompted a theme of, uh, and, a, and a, a list of other questions around data from multiple sources mm -hmm. now, Jen. I mean, yeah. you know, have we got multiple options to consume this type of data? How would it sort of work in practice? Can you give us a view on that? And bearing in mind, before you answer, we've got a couple more questions. We've previously mm -hmm. scheduled for everybody on, on the call. This to last for uh, uh, 45 minutes. So we're, we're gonna try and get through these quickly. Go, go mm -hmm. ahead, Jen. So in terms of consuming data from multiple sources, I mean, I showed one example with the variable items files, if you remember where I was putting together uh, two Excel files. And actually that data grid was set up to accommodate more than two files. It, I, I could have dropped a third on there to aggregate even more data. Um, and I think hopefully I showed that it is relatively easy and that it does work in practice to consume those data from multiple systems. Um, again, once you've set up your data grid and done that piece of configuration, to be able to drop those files in is just as simple as dragging and dropping them across and consuming those data from multiple systems. Once you've got your exports from your different systems, you can just pop them straight in on the data grid and again, have them aggregated or transformed if that makes sense for your use case, like where I excluded rows on one of the files or aggregated the data on the other file. Like most things requires some setup, um, but again, that setup is within this tool and I promise very simple. Okay, uh, which which uh, prompts prompts uh, uh, another question on uh, on uh, the data. Is it is it one size fits all that we have to dictate, or are there lots of options? It sounds like there's options from what you've said. Um, yeah, there's there's lots of options, and I think I mean that's. Um, Oh, and I see another question here about the data files as well. Yes, there, there's lots of options. It's very configurable to make sure that it works with your data that you have. When you are setting up files that we import for our various things, you have the option to tell us a little bit what that data looks like. Maybe your HR system exports data with a bunch of headers and the actual headers that we care about is only on row 10, for example. And there's an option to let us know at import, this is where that data starts. This is a little bit what that data looks like. Um, I do see another question in the Q&A. Does this suggest you have to have commonality of headings from multiple yeah. source files? No, you can just tell us what the headings are that we should expect. And if we don't see them in the file, we won't try and import them. So if you have, F, if you have equity in one file and bonus in another, you don't have to have, for example, a blank column in my equity Excel file to 
the, to account for the bonus in the variable grid that I imported there. Um, so once you've once you've set it up so that you've told us, for example, that there's a, a person and told us that that's a key field, we will try and match that across so that Faith Wilkins is Faith Wilkins in all of those sheets. But yeah, you don't have to have commonality across those headings. You just need to tell us what the files look like before you drop them in so that we understand how to interpret them. Million dollar question, how uh, realistic is it to assume that uh, a pass approach can be deployed quickly and simply? Now, I, I, I think this needs to be framed in the context of how quickly and simply can we deploy a complete global payroll service from one of the traditional vendors? Uh, I don't think it's quick or, or simple in some respects in, in, in those spaces. And as we touched on in the, in the dialogue, uh, if you go through a constant process of re-engineering internally, that's something that you will uh, constantly be working with. But from a pass perspective, from a platform as a service perspective, Jen, and of course it probably depends upon the modules and, and the user case that we're looking to apply, mm -hmm. but can you give us any viewpoints? And I know implementation isn't, isn't your area of expertise, but from a <clears throat> product perspective, uh, can you give us your view on, on implementation durations? Sure. I mean, I think it's pretty realistic to assume that a pass approach can be deployed relatively quickly and simply, especially, I mean, quick in the context of, you know, the deployment of any enterprise system always takes a little bit of time. But I think probably most of the people on the call have a lot of experience with the deployment of more complex, perhaps on-prem systems that have taken months or weeks. And generally, pass timelines are spoken about in or sorry, months or years and in general past timelines are spoken about in, in terms of weeks or months as opposed to months and years because it is a platform and the platform is there for you because you can deploy it deploy it over your existing systems you have a lot of flexibility in how that approach goes um, the platform can be deployed and then you can figure out how it's going to integrate with your processes what processes you're going to change and adapt at a timeline that suits you as well, which I think is kind of a wonderful part of the flexibility of deploying a platform as a service on top of your existing workflow. And then you touched on modules as well. I mean, I showed a couple of modules in the demo there, but again, a nice flexibility that comes with platform as a service is the ability to be almost a little more bespoke with your deployment, to use the modules that are gonna make sense for your business case and your use case and to maybe not avail of modules that aren't going to make sense or to grow into those modules and let it grow with you. And again, because it's platform as a service, you're not talking about a long additional on-prem deploy or a long installation. It's mm -hmm. a case of yeah. having those modules turned on and off, some enablement to make sure you understand how to use them, uh, some configuration perhaps. It's generally a quicker, timeline to get those deployed and to have a new module working as well. So I think it's very realistic to assume that a pass approach can be deployed pretty quickly and simply as well. And would you expect, uh, I'm going to make this the final question because I, I wanted to give people 10 minutes of their time back. Uh, would you expect that a, a client would generally manage this service uh, and the rollout after they've had that initial first phase training and gone through whatever user case that, that they want to deploy, how, would they manage it ongoing? Manage which? Manage the internal implementation, for example, roll or manage of, the service roll itself? The modules, roll out of those modules across other countries. I mean, how, how would that work? I think it would be pretty, it would be pretty flexible and again, dependent on the use case. I know, for example, we provide enablement if that's what people want we'll train people we'll help that rollout some people prefer to roll that out to their own internal customers or their own internal users themselves so it kind of speaks a little bit back to that point about flexibility i made where once you've adopted the platform as a service um approach you have a lot of flexibility then in dictating how that works for your company how disruptive or not that is for your company and how that's going to fit into your processes i mean our goal here is obviously to make life easier, not harder, and yeah, uh, to make processes smoother and quicker. So that's always the goal when we're putting together uh, when we're putting together any of these deployment plans. Well, I don't didn't want to be the one uh, 
repeating the question and answering it. So thank you for answering, <laughs> answering that, Jen. Uh, Bryce, I did say I would try and give everybody some time back. So I think at this point we'll, uh, unless there's nothing new, right, we'll, we will uh, end things from there. I want to very much appreciate, or I very much appreciate everybody's time today and their questions, and for those guys and girls saying hi uh, and uh, giving us some best wishes. I very much look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Webinar is now over officially. Um, but the line will stay open uh, for a couple of minutes just to capture any final comments from the audience or questions. Or if you have something more from us, we will uh, do our best to get that back to you uh, after today's session. Again, we're going to make the uh, uh, information that we shared uh, public, publicly available and probably follow that up with you directly. So thank you again. All the very best. You enjoy the rest of your day and the evening ahead. Thank you.